everybody, welcome back to the Look It All podcast. This is your host, Elias Rush. This podcast is sponsored by EliasRushMedia.com, photo, video, digital media production. Today we are discussing a little blend of an aftercast mixed with, you guessed it, you've seen it behind me, you see, the, you see it all green screen behind me. It is the 96th Academy Awards. It just aired two nights ago, Sunday night, what was it, uh? Oh, the the tenth, I believe, of uh, March. So uh, it was it was a good ceremony. There's not too much to report on, and in, in the negative territory, obviously, thank goodness no one got slapped. Uh, we're that's that's all behind us. It feels very much like a throwback and a classic, a classy show, a very classic um, look to the show but it also has this feel of bringing some very various new talents some foreign talent some not such uh american based talent which this this uh academy of words certainly focused on the other. oh thank you for the follow appreciate that uh rearing tri so um yeah we will be Discussing the Oscars today, a little blend of some worldly news. Again, this is an aftercast, so the aftercast we discuss things such as non-movie reviews, non-TV stuff, but it's more like the outside of the stuff. Now, we will touch on, you know, a couple things we've been watching, a little bit of the Avatar, a little bit of the Dune 2 type stuff. But, uh, you know, on top of that, we'll... um. We'll touch on a couple things that we've missed on from the early January. We haven't gotten to touch base with everybody. Um, uh, let me see. Rearing. Uh, sorry to bother you. Oh, oh, it's a little promotional thing. I have to. We don't do no promotional around here now, Rearing. I'm sorry about that. Not at the moment. But anyways, yeah, we'll be touching on a couple of different things uh, regarding... Um, Worldly news, movie news, what we've been watching, what we haven't been watching, uh, what we've been missing, um, uh, some good TV out there, Shogun, just throw that, throwing that out there for everybody's like, what should I watch right now? I'll just, I, I come for the reviews, uh, Shogun, there you go, there's your, rev- uh, there's your recommendation right there, um, think of uh, like Japanese Game of Thrones on Hulu. So anyways, let's get down to the basics of why everyone's here. Why everyone wants to discuss uh, all that goodness. Let me see. Um, what we came down, what we came here to do. Now, if you're watching the um, now, if you're watching the live stream, then you will be able to see the the winners in real time. We will have them up to the uh, side of the screen. You'll be able to see the nominees and the winners at the same time. I will. Um, so it won't be any drum rolls or anything like that. But uh, I do want to talk about all these uh, wonderful movies. It's it's uh, been 2023 as a whole, I would say. It's been an eclectic year in in so much as in in a year of movies, there's a lot of classically bound movies, the ones that feel like the holdovers the the Oppenheimers the one that the the movies that are guaranteed to um you know really bring in you know the the old heads the old cinema heads and stuff like that now I I feel like that there's a nice blend of these types of movies so we have the Oppenheimers the whole holdovers I'm gonna go ahead through the the best pictures nominees um starting with the the big boys so yeah, we have uh, Best Picture uh, winner, Oppenheimer. Okay, you know, congratulations to uh, one of my favorite directors, Nolan, and of course uh, his uh, wife, uh, Emma Thomas. And they have, uh, I believe, Charles Roven's uh, producer, I believe. But anyways, the, um, the Oppenheimer of it all just feels like a collection of all of the best and most talented people working at some of their highest strengths so for instance that's like robert downey jr has had multi, i think multiple attempts to to get uh the oscar and i believe he's lost every time now the fact that he's lost every time 
I don't have it right in front of me how much, you know, the who are the individuals he lost out to for maybe, I'm pretty sure he got nominated for something like Zodiac or, or some of these bigger roles. But I, I feel like this Oppenheimer win is a collection of, you know, Robert Downey Jr., Killian Murphy, um, Nolan, uh, all of all of the big the big names. It came down to them working at their pinnacle. Now I feel like it wasn't some of it. It was some of the best of Robert Downey Jr.'s work, but I think I've seen him do other you know better stuff. Um, I think it's a well deserved win. Nolan, I think he's at the top of his game. Um, you know, this was kind of lower on my top ten list. If I be, if if I'm looking at, uh, if I'm trying to remember correctly, I'm not even sure Oppenheimer made the top ten. I know it didn't make the top five for me, but um, but uh, it was what I found was a very respectable movie, and everyone is like I said, just working at the top of their game, and um, it's all it's all very much warranted and um you know uh, well deserved now looking at these other more classical and then some more eclectic movies now when i say classical i mean more like the holdovers it feels like it was shot in the 70s and it has this uh this layer of heart to it i feel like that really works with it um let barbie and Zone of Interest could not be any more different in the tone and the type of filmography and the type of experience that you get when watching these two films. Now, the Zone of Interest, for anyone that is like a, a, uh, out of the loop of this, I believe it was a foreign film, maybe Polish. I'm sorry if I don't have I don't have the right one. Right. Let me see. Da, da, da. Anyways, I don't I don't have the uh, where the production was. It might have been Germany. I I, I can't find it. Anyways, um, but it was created uh, da, 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 historical drama film written loosely directed by UK and Poland. Okay, so yes, the 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 uh, the story is loosely based on the twenty fourteen novel of Martin Armas itself, primarily based on real events. It's uh, basically uh, stars full German actors as uh, the Nazi commandant Rudolf Haas uh, and his wife Hedwig who live with their family in a home in the zone of interest, quote unquote, next to the Auschwitz concentration camp. Now, it is... It's it's a harrowing experience. Oh, sorry, I got jumped. Do, do I look like Jambi the Genie from this sit right here? I'm sorry. Don't, don't ask why I got Jambi right here. <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, that's all. Uh, that's funny. Uh, sorry, I talk about zone interest and then suddenly Jambi pops up. Anyways, <laughs> oh goodness, let me pop that back up. Oscars. Oh my goodness. Da, 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 da. Let me pop this back off. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um Yeah. <laughs> That's so fucking ridiculous to talk about Zone of Interest, the most serious of movies, and then all of a sudden Jombie pops up. <laughs> I was gonna ask everybody if Jombie do I look like Jombie with my head just like it green screened back here if I if I got rid of this green screen would that look like Jombie? <laughs> anyways, um that's that's extremely embarrassing. Yeah, anyways. So Zone of Interest, it's literally it feels like you are a fly on the wall in the family of uh, of a Nazi a, a, a Nazi family that is living beside Auschwitz and basically the father is it feels like a 1950s father going to and from work while well, we'll see ya. and you know all the kids are like bye dad you know and the moms be in the house mom and stuff like that and but when you look outside it's fucking Auschwitz outside and and you hear like these screams and the sounds we'll talk about the the zone of interest in the sound but uh the the movie is eerie and uncomfortable as hell 
there's long silences it's it's a it feels the exact opposite of the bright popping barbie that is in the same category which i which tells me that this was a wide cast of a year um so you know not to say anything you know bad about either one but it's just like that's that's crazy um i saw all of the movies in this category with the exception of past lives which i'll catch up on i've heard phenomenal things about it a lot of people put on the top 10 caught up on anatomy of a fall last night rented it on um uh, Amazon Prime, and um, I enjoyed it a lot. It was a little bit long for me, but the the acting in it and in the young man and the oh my goodness the, the 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 mom and son are phenomenal in that movie. Um, it's the direction is is uh, very captivating and it is a very intense story. Um, don't want to go through all of these different movies, but um. I did enjoy American fiction. I found a little bit more flaws in it than than I would have normally uh, had for a best picture. But um, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon and Maestro. Okay, so I kind of feel like they're a little bit... They, they don't have the same problem, but they both are very broad in, in the spectrum. So, you know, Maestro, uh, Bradley Cooper becomes, you know, uh, a maestro and he's... Uh, yeah, it's the uh, bio biographical romantic drama film that centers around the uh, comp- the American composer Leonard Bernstein and his wife, and it is it's an extensive tale for uh, Bradley Cooper to you know to tackle as well as um, becoming you know s- several sections you know the the old Bernstein the young Bernstein he's all the Bernsteins. And the problem is, for me, I felt like the the movie's called Maestro, but he's really only, you know, maybe like conducting like a little bit. And there's a lot more of, you know, the, the woman behind the man, which I loved Carrie Mulligan's uh, uh, performance as uh, Felicia Montague. But it almost felt like she was taking over the movie in a way. I was like, are, why don't we just like make a movie about her? Which kind of felt like it was... It was like nearly like 60 40 about him versus her and i was like i'm not really sure what this movie wants to really be and um it feels like it was trying to be all the things in the same way that uh killers of the flower moon which is i believe also based off of another um book let me see am i am i wrong with that no, no, no. It is. It's based off the uh, 2017 nonfiction book. Uh, oh, screenplay based off the uh, yeah, yeah, by David Gran. And um, yeah, it 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 um it focuses on the series of murders of the Osage members and the relations in the Osage Nation after oil was discovered on tribal land. Um, you know, the tribal members had retained mineral rights on their reservation, but a corrupt local political boss sought to steal the wealth. And so for many people that didn't watch the three hour and 26 minute, uh, Martin Scorsese epic, which if you're a Scorsese head, if you're a film nut, if you're into, um, you know, even even this historical uh, fact, um, then this was something that you wanted to tackle. This was uh, a film that you wanted to see probably represented in the, obviously in the industry, obviously having Killers of the Flower Moon brings way more light on, and you know, more focus on to the subject of uh, the atrocities that have happened uh, to uh, indigenous people and um, my biggest problem I did not review this one for a couple of reasons because I was like what what am I going to say that's going to really change the Scorsese film it, it, he's he's practically he's a master of his you know game and even to the point where I feel like there is a sidebar of this movie that it very much ends with 
Killers of the Flower Moon, Martin Scorsese, almost, he literally breaks the fourth wall. It's a slight spoiler if you want for this movie. It's, it's you know, it, it, it's not going to really be anything that changes anything. But uh, Martin Scorsese physically walks onto like the stage and gives like a radio, radio play, giving, you know, explanation to these murders to the story and saying basically that he can only do so much uh to you know justice to the story from saying it from his uh, specific point of view you know uh my biggest problem with the movie was i felt like there you know the movie was about the osage murders it was about the indigenous people however it felt like it was lacking a serious indigenous voice, despite Lily Gladstone's uh, Oscar nom- nominating performance. You know, she stands out from uh, the lot in the crowd of of actors and actresses that are doing the most. And it's almost the same way that you know Emma Stone is doing the most acting wise in poor things and doing a phenomenal job doing it but in the same way that lily gladstone is kind of doing the least and it's hard to do both spectrums equally so i thought either one could have won the uh, the oscar amazing that uh, emma stone is so young and she's already got two oscars under her belt um recently i'd seen uh la la land i thought it was good but um i thought this performance was much much more stronger um but yeah so um all right so um yeah that's kind of the lot of the movies that we've seen and uh, anatomy of a fall like uh it's it's an intense thriller with kind of it's almost a mix of a courtroom drama mixed with like a, a, a dramatic suspense thriller in some some aspects and i believe it's i believe this is based off of a, a real case let me see okay so although the plot is not based on a true story the essence is rooted in real life okay so it's it, it's um it seems like it, it's it's rooted in real life. Okay, so it's not exactly rooted in, or it's not exactly a true story, though. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, oh, and Poor Things. I haven't really talked too much about Poor Things. Poor Things is almost the cinematic blend of, you know, that that catnip, that cinematic catnip that you want, but also blending it with the weirdness that Barbie has. For anyone that hasn't seen it, a lot of people are calling Poor Things the Frankenstein's Barbie. And I felt like that was the the way that you would describe this movie to a T. I was like, Frankenstein's Barbie, why didn't I think of that? I was like, this is, it's, 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 it's brilliant. And it's a slightly more mature version of Barbie for reasons that you would watch it for. Um, but you know, if you, if you liked Barbie, I think that uh, Poor Things is actually a, a great, uh, second second watch with it um and of course zone of interest is a very cold calculus movie it uh it feels almost sterile in the way that it's shot um and borderline documentary like to the point where it's just like it's uncomfortable to be there it's uncomfortable to be in this zone go to speak it's it, everything about it feels weird and eerie and it's supposed to kind of be this juxtaposition of having uh, you know regular life mixed with the atrocities uh, and 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 in the worst parts uh, of life that you could even think about 
you know, straight up committing genocide in your fucking neighbor's yard. It, it's just, it's, it's insanity. So, um, yeah, I just want to make sure we covered all those nominees. And, and The Holders was my favorite movie of last year, without a doubt. Um, even looking at this list right now of all of the, the Best Picture nominees, it was the most fulfilling movie, in my opinion, from the fact of understanding the narrative, the the pacing. I felt like the characters, all of it really hit in ways that I don't feel like the rest of these films always hit. Like Barbie was probably my second strongest one when it comes down to it. But even then, it was still kind of, uh, I don't want to say preachy in ways, but it, it, it borderline was was uh, hitting, you know, hitting you over, head, over the head with a lot of monologues, which I think all of the monologues worked, but I just felt like a lot of times it felt like the characters would stop and just have to explain themselves just out loud for whatever reason, even though it was a weird world and they had set it up to be like that. You know, just, it just, it, that was my kind of problem with it. Um, not kind of going full hog with being kind of uh, serious, but it, again, it's it's not supposed to be serious. It's supposed to be a fun, lighthearted time with having a, a strong centered message that old, overall, I think, well, is a well-deserved spot in the nominated spot. Um, and so Best Actor went to Killian Murphy. He won for playing Oppenheimer. Uh, he was in the categories along with Coleman Domingo and Rustin, as Rustin, Paul Giamatti and the Holdovers, uh, Bradley Cooper as uh, the, uh, Leonard Bernstein, and uh, Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction. People loved American Fiction. Jeffrey Wright, now let me talk about Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright's always been worthy of a nomination in just about everything he's been in. He's not bad ever. And he's basically like the garlic salt of, you know, of actors, which means you can add them to every, anything and almost anything, it makes it better. And, um, of course, uh, Col Coleman Domingo, I haven't seen that movie, Rustin, I've heard his, he's, he's great in it. Um, I know he can be great. I've seen, everything I've seen him in, he's been great. I think he was, one of my favorite roles, I believe, was in Euphoria. He kind of plays like this older, uh, wiser uncle to uh, Zendaya's character in that. And uh, I've, I, I thought that, that, you know, he, he always has a lot of gravitas and I love his voice. Uh, Bradley Cooper is maestro. He just goes hog to the wall. He just commits. He just fucking commits. He's a, he's a committer, which is great. Um, I want to see Bradley Cooper get weirder, you know, just in these, he, he's kind of just like exploring himself as a creator and finding himself more outside of his, you know, you know, good looks and weird nature from, um, uh, the whole, the, the holders, the, the hangover, Paul Giamatti. Oh my gosh. Watch the holdovers. You'll understand why he, he deserves a spot up there. He's he is that character. He is the sad sack character over the holidays that has no family that you just feel bad for. But I mean, he's also kind of a curmudgeon as well. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a well deserved spot. And, and of course, Killian Murphy has just got the million yard stare and. Um, his performance as Oppenheimer cannot be understated. Let's continue on to Best Actress. So let's go ahead and talk about the two big actresses that were in the, I'd say, the highest competition to possibly win. The uh, the Oscar, it was Emma Stone, who was the winner for playing Bella Baxter uh, in Poor Things. She was in competition with Lily Gladstone. Many people thought Lily Gladstone had 
this year's nominee, um, you know, in the bag. And I thought that I, I pretty much uh, explained earlier, you know, Emma Stone is doing the most type of acting. You know, her body is going crazy. Her eyes are all over the place. She's literally, she she does, she she literally bears it all mentally, physically, and maybe spiritually. I don't know. She she goes for it, hog for the wall, hog for the wall. Is that does, is hog for the wall? She goes ball to the wall. Sorry, I don't know hog. Hog wild and balls of the wall. Did I just hog to the wall? <laughs> I just made some. She goes, she goes for it. She goes for it in ways many actors wouldn't even think about it. Let's just say, it's uh, it's it's one of the bravest performances I've ever seen, and it's one of the best performances. And she gains my forever respect for for going this this hog wild, and just having this sense of dramatic chops i don't feel like any of these yeah if you look at the rest of the um the actresses all of these are very serious performances lily gladstone has an immensely serious performance and it's rightfully so so supposed to be but she's also shows signs of vulnerability um emma stone does as well but i mean to um she just gets a lot more opportunities throughout the film to show a wider spectrum of emotion um you know from happy sad excited what whatever you know and of course um let's talk about the rest of the winners real quick uh, lily gladstone i believe was the first indigenous oscar nominee and possibly she was going to be the winner but uh obviously uh she did not win um but i think that she, just her being in the nominee categories just being in the categories with like carrie mulligan and uh annette being as uh, in naiad and sanjo hoyer um in anatomy of a fall all of these women are fucking on fire this year with their acting i mean i was uh, i was blown away from all of them just showing the, the spectrum of emotion and of course i'd say carrie mulligan is the one that's the most uh i guess veteran veteranized or something like that i'm not even sure what the she's the biggest veteran of these uh women i believe that has uh let me uh in addition to nominees two nominations for okay she's she's gotten three nominations 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 for uh academy awards yeah, she, uh, Carrie Mulligan has racked it up, and she's so young too. I, f I forget how young she's. She's only thirty eight, but she has such a, a timeless look. She looks like she can, she can play like a thirty eight year old in like in nineteen thirty eight. You know. Um, yeah, love Carrie Mulligan, uh, as well as all of these other actresses that have brought the fucking fire. They just bring they bring the fire every time. Um, I'm surprised Carrie has uh, uh, Mulligan hasn't won. Uh, oscar yet i would have assumed that she would have won but she's been nominated like three or four times three times now um of course and yeah they were all great um continuing on best international feature film zone of interest like i said it's very cold calculated movie the only other movie i saw in here that absolutely tore me to shreds and i would highly recommend it if you are ready for a cinematic experience based off a true story that is going to leave you shattered at the end um it's on netflix it is called society of the snow uh my girlfriend had to pick me up off of a puddle out of uh, off of, out of a puddle of just like pieces and ashes and i was just like end up fucking i was in a pile i was like Bleh. i was just like i was just completely uh destroyed after it um the zone of interest might be slightly more quote unquote important for the the matter if you want to talk about it from like a, a scale matter if you want to really talk about like the the true aspect of it but um which is why i understand in, in the technical aspect of just how um uh cold and calculating the the film is the whole time i can understand it but society of the snow that was the one fuck me up So, uh, 
Continuing on, Best Supporting Actress, Divine Joy Randolph. In The Holdovers, um, absolutely exceptional. I don't even have to say much more than that. Um, I will say she's generally known for the comedies and slightly more serious roles in comedies. Like I think she's played like a, 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 she played a cop, a, a funny straight edge cop and, and only murders in the building. And I believe she was also in, uh, uh, the idol. That was it. And, um, yeah, I just, I thought she, she, she blew it out of the park. Just her, her spectrum of emotion and, and her speech was very touching as well. Loved her speech. Emily Blunt was also, uh, nominated for Oppenheimer, American Ferrer for Barbie, Danielle Brooks for the color of purple and Jodie Foster and Naya at all. Um, I'm sure I saw all of them except for the color purple and Danielle Brooks. Danielle Brooks being in there is is phenomenal. I'm so glad to see her being uh, at least nominated for best supporting actress. I'm sure she was. Uh, she uh, I'm sure all of the women were excited to see Miss Randolph. Um, uh, you know, grab the uh, grab the Oscar. But um, I am glad to see all of these women up there too. American Ferrera, America Ferrera, and Barbie. She. She kind of goes off. She's one of the, the, the actresses or one of the actors in the um, Barbie movie that um, also kind of have these like moments of just like they, they just got to explain themselves and stuff like that. She's good at doing that, that type of exposition, though, that, you know, monologuing. Uh, let's see. The best original song went to Billie Eilish and Phineas for What Was I Made For in the Barbie movie. Um, I believe... That was the only movie I saw with uh, the, the Flamin' Hot. I did not see the Flamin' Hot movie, unfortunately. Uh, did not see the Netflix documentary American Symphony. Uh, I'm just Ken. Oh, that was the uh, Barbie movie again. And uh, a song from my people. I don't believe I saw that one either. Was easy. Um, so yeah, Barbie had two songs in here. The fact that Barbie got all of these nominations... Uh, from best original song to best picture to just all of these. I mean, how many nominations did they get? Like at least like four or five. Um, like it, it's it's phenomenal that it even it it's able to capture that big of a zeitgeist. It was good. It was based off an IP. You know, with uh, with Greta Gerwig at the at the helm. It just seems like everything went right for this movie, and I hope that you know giving the keys to Greta, Greta Gerwig and, and Margot Robbie continues to bring more life in this. Uh, franchise which it definitely is now so best supporting actor went to everyone thought it was going to go to this guy but we weren't sure robert downey jr in uh oppenheimer let me go ahead and go through the rest of the list real quick sterling k brown play, played an amazing um family member in american fiction mark ruffalo just went balls to the wall again with with um, <laughs> Emma Stone going crazy and, and Poor Things. Um, watch Poor Things on Hulu if you haven't seen it. Uh, actually, most of these are, are available on some sort of streaming. I think Oppenheimer, uh, Oppenheimer is an, uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is an uh, Peacock. I think Killers of the Flower Moon with Robert De Niro. He was uh, in the supporting actor as well. He This is available on uh, Apple uh, TV and then... Uh, and De Niro plays a great De Niro character. I don't, it's like an expected De Niro performance. Like, he's so good, it's like, oh, he's back, baby, he's back. But um, Robert Downey had not won uh, an Oscar before, and this was kind of his year. Everyone had kind of agreed. And, uh, of course, Ryan Gosling nominated for Best Supporting Actor. I kind of forgot, which is uh, it's which is great. He, he, he goes for broke in um, Barbie, but... Um, obviously RDJ pulled it through best director this is one of my favorite directors that I've been following since as early as I can remember best director went to Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer this year um, Justin Triet is the Anatomy of the Fall uh, nominated director Martin Scorsese is the obviously uh, directed the killers of the flower moon jonathan glazer nominated for the zone of interest and yorgos lanthimos for poor things all of them i'd say are obviously worth 
the nominations, Oppenheimer just seems to be the magnum opus that Christopher Nolan was always leaning towards. It it, it brings all of his his timey wimey stuff. It brings his love of history. It brings his 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 technical craftsmanship. It brings uh, Hoyt Van Hoytema's uh, amazing visuals. It's it, it, and and then the editing on top of it it just it, and the sound it, it's it's a phenomenal film and it was quite an experience to see um in theaters it's a well-deserved director directorial um win the best animated feature a lot of people were um a little bit skeptical about this one but um most people that were smart put Hayao Miyazaki as the boy in the heron's best animated feature winner. Um, Miyazaki, obviously an eclectic, uh, lovable franchise creator of Studio Ghibli's best of the best of the best of the best. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it was just backed. It, 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 I think it is marketed as maybe his last film or many people thought it was going to be his last film for a while but who knows at this point he let him keep on going elemental was another uh, another um touching film it was a surprisingly touching film that would took a very slow start at the beginning of 2023 and just continued to run and run and run and make more money and people are like damn this movie is gonna make a lot of making a lot of money and it kind of pulled the wonka effect and just kept kept staying in the top five for uh, weeks and what became on months and it was uh, pretty much a hit Nimona on Netflix was actually a surprisingly touching film um, uh, with as a someone that could transform into different beings it was very much uh, an allegory for being a, a trans individual or being part of the LGBT community and I thought that uh, if you looked at it through a, uh, through specific lenses like that, I thought it was a very touching film. And um, the way that it was kind of showing the people being represented, uh, showing characters being represented and being seen was um, important in this. And it kind of, this Nimona goes up with the lineup of amazing uh, animated TV shows and movies that Netflix has provided for us for a couple of years now. I'm still always surprised at uh, the level and quality of maturity that Netflix is willing to hit with their um, with their uh, animated features. Best live action short. The only one I saw on this list out of Invincible, The Red, White, and Blue, Night of fortune the after the only one i saw was wes anderson's the wonderful story of henry sugar which actually won i think this was his first win i was um i was pretty uh pretty excited to see wes anderson finally win something i mean all of his movies look so difficult to shoot from a technical standpoint and they just feel so calculated in a way that every single thing has to be uh thought of before or created um and he's such a a creative mind i felt like the wonderful story of henry sugar kind of demonstrated all of that and uh a relative a relative a relative uh quick fashion best documentary feature i did not see any of these documentary features unfortunately but i will check it out the 20 days and Mary Poole was the winner. I believe this is, uh, let me see. As the Russian invasion begins, a team of U Ukraine journalists trapped in the besieged city of Mariupol struggle to continue their work documenting, uh, documenting the, uh, the war. And um, it's 135 minutes. Going to have to sit down and watch that. It's uh, probably a harrowing one to watch but it's an important one that the one of the first things that the director said when he got up um and uh grabbed or, or grabbed or they gave him the oscar he said uh don't take me word for it but i think he said i wish i had never had to make this had to make this movie and uh you know that's really that 
that's like a holy shit you know you get the highest acclaim for one of the worst things that has ever happened in most recent history it's like ugh, i can i can understand that i can understand that um best visual effects uh best visual effects went rightly to well i'm not sure rightly to all of these effects were phenomenal i'd say napoleon was the one that uh felt like the most practical of effects but uh guardians of the galaxy napoleon mission impossible dead reckoning the creator all amazing films from the special effects visual effects standpoint but there was one there was one that took it all godzilla minus one godzilla minus one i was so happy to see these well there was a video going around when it showed the team the director it's a very small team and director the director's on the special effects team too um one of the rare times they are it showed them getting so excited when they got a nomination just the nomination for godzilla minus one and then on top of that winning and seeing them in the crowd and just seeing them all super excited it just felt like i, I wanted to i was nearly in tears myself i felt like i was seeing you know my kids win or something like that i was like they did it they did it you motherfuckers did it and um seeing godzilla minus one um you know do well in the theaters do well critically do well you know just with with uh, you know in the oscars it's god godzilla is now an oscar winner and i'm not sure if this is the first time godzilla has won an oscar but um you know they, they brought it home they brought it home and I, I loved every bit of it um and it, it, looking at this i think godzilla minus one is the strongest story out of all these two god uh, guardians of the galaxy is pretty dang strong up there too but um yeah Best Adapted Screenplay, American Fiction, Beat Out, The Zone of Interest, Barbie, Poor Things, and Oppenheimer. Uh, now, I think they were all great picks, all great picks. I was not in love with American Fiction as much as as i was with you poor things or even oppenheimer but i have a lot of respect for american fiction it feels like a mashup of two films for anyone that hasn't seen it it's basically it was advertised as a failing writer african-american writer or black or writer depending on whichever your preferences um a failing writer that was trying to get his name out there so the only way to get his name out there was to, or he was seeing other more popular um, black artists, writers, creators, write in a more, I don't know, code switching way, you know, uh, hit him with a quote unquote, you know, uh, he started talking like a, a quote unquote, like thug or writing like a thug and, or writing like a, uh, a, a gangster or something like that or you know it's the movies advertised as what if a well-spoken guy writes as a non-well-spoken guy you know more kind of you know yo yo yo's it up kind of stuff you know it's just like very much makes it stereotypical borderline satiric it's like satirical racism i guess in a way and the movie is advertised that way but what the movie really becomes about which is a minor plot spoiler it's more about how he's uh, he's financially not doing great and he has to do what he can to support him, his family which one of them being is his uh mother who has uh, i believe she has dementia of some sort it's either dementia or some sort of a uh, 
uh, dementia-like illness. And I thought the movie became way more about his family focus, which I was totally fine with seeing a, a dramatic family focused movie, but I felt like it was advertised as like a 40, 60 split of like a comedy drama when it became more like a, a 20, 80 split with most of the comedy bits coming in between. And uh, I thought more of the, 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 the comedy was kind of interweaved with the, uh, the family and kind of being relatable with uh, the, the brothers and, um, having uh jeffrey wright kind of being the 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 straight edge brother with uh, uh sterling k brown being kind of the uh, uh the non-straight edge brother you know the one that went off the rails that doesn't exactly go by the law kind of thing um the dynamic is amazing i love the i love the film and from the standpoint of hanging out with them as a family i was like that i could easily see myself watching a few hours of just hanging out with this family but the movie is very it's very it's heavier than i was expecting i think um and heavier in ways that i was not prepared to love and so um that it, it didn't really have to do with the actual writing of the characters it had to do with more of just how the plot was centered and i felt like uh, I was given a different movie from what I was sold, but um, still very respectable. Cord Jefferson had a, a a great speech up there. I love how he uh, brought up the point of let's have um, 10, 20, uh, 10, 20 million dollar movies instead of you know one two hundred million dollar movies or uh, you know uh, four fifty million dollar movies instead of you know a two hundred million dollar movie. He's just saying that give more. Uh, opportunities to more uh, filmmakers and creatives like that and I thought if for him just to get up there and say that I was like that's what I'm talking about um, let's continue on best documentary I have not seen any of these unfortunately but the last repair shop won out over uh, island in between grandma and grandma the ABC's of book banning and the barber of Little Rock the best original screenplay went to Anatomy of a Fall, beating out Past Lives. The holdovers May December and Maestro. I haven't really talked too much about Past Lives because obviously I haven't seen it, but um, I will have that on my to to watch list. Um, May December is um, sorry if you hear this chair. It kind of sounds like I'm tooting a little bit, but I can't stop it from doing that. Um, the uh, May December. The uh, screenplay, the direction, the movie, the film, haven't really talked about too much. I have tremendous respect for everyone that is in it. The direction, the look, the feel, the way the story turns towards the end. About the last 30 minutes sou uh, soured me a little bit on the uh, on the, the, the character motivations and stuff like that, which made me like it a little bit less. But... Um, Overall, I think it's a it's a very strong movie with strong performances from uh, Moore and Portman, um, and uh, obviously Anatomy of Fall. I've talked about it earlier. It was uh, uh, it was it was interesting and entertaining, and and just like it grabbed you immediately, right off right off the bat, just from. The true crime aspect of it all and the way that it kind of tackles the the going through the motions of a crime um, and uh, of course the court hearing and stuff like that best animated short war is over inspired by the music of john and yoko beat out 95 uh, senses our uniform uh, Patchy Durham and Letter to to a Pig. I have not seen those yet. Best original score went to Oppenheimer for uh, Ludwig Göransson beat out over uh, Jerskin's fin Findex of Poor Things, Laura Carpen's American Fiction, John Williams for the uh, Indiana Jones of Dial of Destiny, which kind of felt like a rehash of a lot of the other ones, but whatever. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon, Robbie Robertson. I thought that was another good one. The Killers of the Flower Moon had a very, uh, not a sinister score, but it, 
um, sinister is not the right word, but it was, it was cold, I think. Best cinematography went to Oppenheimer. Hoyt Van Hoyten, my man. Working with uh, uh, Christopher Nolan several times, Dunkirk, went, uh, worked with uh, Jordan Peele and Nope. He's done tons of amazing looking films. Uh, Maestro was uh, the other nominee, Poor Things, El uh, Conde, and uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, all beautiful looking films that have not seen El Conde yet. Um, Poor Things won for Best Makeup and Hair Design. Sorry, Makeup and Hair Styling. So when Poor Things was racking up these like more design aspect uh, parts of the uh, of the awards, I didn't think that Emma Stone was going to pull in the Oscar for Best Actress. I thought that they were going to go with Lily Gladstone or um, or pull a different... I, I, or you're probably Lily Gladstone um, because they were giving all of these kind of like technical things to like uh, poor things and Oppenheimer. And so, um, yeah, makeup and hairstyling with the poor things, best costume with the uh, poor things, best production design went to poor things as well. Best film editing went to uh, Oppenheimer. And um, then... Uh, best sound by far i think well, maybe not by far I, i'd say the uh the oppenheimer maestro and um yeah all of them all of them did exceptional jobs but uh, especially um oppenheimer just had uh probably the second best sound from the zone of interest i was not a big fan of zone of interest just, just from the uh technical standpoint of watching it i understood why it was nominated just constantly overbearing the entire time you're watching it like i said it just feels like you're in different aspects of a, a nazi a, a nazi family's house and we're watching someone just go from room to room just doing minute things the you know um in the house just maybe cleaning going outside just and then walking and all of a sudden you see like a smokestack outside and it's fucking people being uh you know incinerated or something like that it's like my jesus and the entire time you're just in this house that you're in the you're in the zone of interest and in, in, you're in the uh in the house you can just hear the what sounds like a factory in the background and sometimes it's screaming and yelling and terrible things happening in the background and it's highly disturbing the sound of this movie i would say is 30 this movie is 30 percent sound and it's uh you know the sound the sound of any movie puts you in the place but holy shit this put you in the place um but yes, yeah, so that is the 96th annual Academy Awards. Let me know what you thought about the Academy Awards. Let me know what you thought about the reviews of, you know, some of the stuff we covered. Um, you know, drop a drop a, a comment on YouTube or check us out on uh, Twitch, which we are live. Um, we are live at the moment. And, uh, yeah, you know what to do. Check out lugdogpodcast.com. All the links in the, in the description.